Okay, we're going to uh, continue on here talking chapter 14, the never ending chapter. Uh, we started getting into at the end last time. Uh, really, again, as I mentioned, sort of the heart of the chapter here. Uh, we talked about the idea of common ion effect. And remember that the common ion effect is uh, pretty much the name sounds like. We have some type of weak acid or weak base that's basically dissociating. And in there with it is essentially a common ion. And so, for example, we looked at acetic acid, which is a weak acid. And under normal circumstances with acetic acid all by itself, it would break apart into acetate and an H plus ion. And in solution by itself, it will set up this equilibrium where we basically have everybody in the solution, right? So we got some acetic acid that's still together. Uh, we have some acetate that's floating around and we obviously have some H plus in the solution to begin with. Now, when we have a acid like this and we throw something in there, like I think it was sodium acetate we were looking at. When we take something like sodium acetate, which is really a salt, kind of like what we were doing with today, uh, it's just really a strong electrolyte. And when it goes for a swim, it is not going to stay together. It's going to break apart into really its ions, which would be the sodium ion and the acetate ion. So when we add some sodium acetate to a solution that has acetic acid, we're essentially throwing into the mix really these two ions. So when we would do that, we would now add some sodium ions in there. We would also add some acetate ions in there. And now it's this addition of the acetate ions, which essentially is like adding more of our products here. And based on Le Chatelier's principle, that's going to cause the equilibrium to shift away from whatever side we added it to. And in this case, it will shift away from the side we added it to. The result of that is in terms of pH, which is what we're talking about here, pH is really determined by the concentration of H plus in solution. It's really the concentration of this guy in the solution that's floating around by itself that's really going to have a big effect on pretty much the pH of that solution. So as we add the acetate into the solution, it's gonna cause that shift to the left. And that ultimately is gonna cause the H plus concentration to start to decrease. And as the H plus start, concentration starts to go down, because OH minus is also tied to that, that basically means OH minus is going up. And that would also mean that we would start to see the pH start to climb in comparison to if we just had acetic acid in there basically by itself. So the ultimate effect of a common ion is it will keep basically a weak acid and also a weak base together. And the result of that is it will affect the pH. In the case of an acid, we will actually see probably a slightly higher pH than we would if we had just a weak acid by itself. In the case of a base, you know, if you had something like NH3, you know, something like this, and maybe we added some ammonium chloride to the mix here, right? When we'd add ammonium chloride, it would break apart into ammonium and some chloride. Obviously the common ion here would be the ammonium in this example. The presence of that ammonium, right, is once again going to cause the equilibrium to shift to the left. The result of that in sort of a basic situation is we will again see here that actually the OH minus concentration goes down, which means really the H plus concentration comes up. And the result of that is the pH will actually go down from where it started with in terms of the weak base. So the effect on a weak base is it will have a kind of this normal pH of just the weak base by itself because of the suppression of that weak base from being able to really sort of break apart. 
is going to decrease the hydroxide concentration and we actually will see the pH come down a little bit or some bit there from where it started from. And again, that's sort of the opposite effect that we see in an acid uh, where the pH will actually climb a little bit uh, in that case. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> so uh, we can do a problem here. I think it's where we left off. Uh, uh, we have part A, which is calculate the pH of a solution that's 0.2 molar acetic acid. And part B here, where we're going to calculate the uh, pH of a solution that is 0.2 molar acetic acid and 0.3 molar sodium acetate. Uh, they gave us a Ka value there for our acetic acid, which is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So we'll start with part A here, which I'm sure we all did. So we'll start with part A here. You could follow along with me in your work that you did before you got here. So here, this is uh, 0.2 molar acetic acid. And we're really looking for the uh, pH of the solution. And once again, they gave us the Ka value 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. So this acid here is obviously a weak acid, right? Because we have a Ka value, which means if I want to calculate pH, I need to do what here? This would be just a regular old Ka type of problem, right? An ice table. So that's what we would do in this situation. So we'll take our weak acid, which will set up an equilibrium in the solution. Break apart a little bit into H plus and acetate. Initially here, we have 0.2. And again, zero of this guy and zero of that guy. Our change part here, assuming going left to right, minus X, plus X, and plus X. That means at equilibrium here, 0 0.2 minus X, X, and X. Any questions on the ice table here? So as we've done before, earlier on in this chapter, we're going to now put this into our Ka expression. So our Ka expression here going to be our products divided by our reactants. So putting in our values here gives us x squared up on top, uh, 0 0.2 minus x on the bottom, and that will equal our 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. I'm going to assume that x is equal to zero here. And once again, it is going to be really the X we're subtracting in this case. And that will get us X squared up on top, uh, 0 0.2 on the bottom equals 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. Once again, here, I'm gonna multiply the 0.2 to the other side and also take the square root of it at the same time. Or right, after I do that, I suppose would be the proper order there. 1.8 to the minus five times 0.2, a little square root action <laughs> happening there. And that's going to give us, I grab this pen here, x is equal to 0.001897-ish. Bless you. We do want to, again, always make sure that we do check it when we make the assumption. So once again, we would take our x value. Uh, we're going to divide it by 0.2, which is what we're going to subtract it from, times a little 100 action there. So taking that divided by 0.2 times 100, uh, looks like 0.9%, so that is a good check on that deal. So from our table, since we're interested in pH, obviously that is what we're interested in. And we see that the H plus concentration equals X, uh, which means we'll go with 0 0.001897 molar. That means going into our pH minus the log of that number, and that's going to give us, clean it up a little bit here at the end, one, eight, nine, seven, I think. This is something like a uh, 2.72 for our pH, uh, which is obviously acidic, which makes sense as this is obviously a acid in this case. Any question on any of those steps there? So this is just really a basic Ka type problem. Yeah. 
Yeah, so really, uh, I, I kind of kept a lot of digits to the end, but really the only number we had going on was really this number. And really the concentration there had two significant figures. So usually you then would go to two decimal places on the pH. Yeah. So the, the pH rule is that uh, sig figs in the concentration, decimal places in the pH, and vice versa if you're going backwards, pH, decimal places to sig figs in the concentration. Other questions on that there? So that is part A, which is really just a weak acid by itself in the solution, kind of floating around doing its thing, setting up its equilibrium. Now, when we look at part B here, uh, we're looking at what is the pH with the same 0.2 molar acetic acid, but in this case, we're also going to have in there 0.3 molar sodium acetate, uh, which is really gonna provide us a common ion. So in this case, we got our uh, 0 0.2 molar acetic acid uh, with, it was 0.3 molar, I believe, right? Sodium acetate. Once again, here, our Ka value for our acetic acid is still the 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. So we do have, in this case, two things going on. We have our acetic acid, which is again going to set up the same equilibrium. We also have our sodium acetate there which will not set up an equilibrium since it's just a salt. So it's just gonna break apart basically like my picture earlier. So this guy will once again here, break apart into sodium ion and acetate. So our common ion obviously here is going to be our acetate, right? In this case, that is our common ion. So how does that affect our calculation? So if we were gonna go through our calculation here, initially, right, uh, we got 0 0.2 of this guy. We have nothing of this guy. And what about this guy here, acetate? Do we have anything initially for that? The answer is we do, and it's supplied by the sodium acetate that was put in there. So that again is really a source of acetate, which means if this guy is 0.3 molar, what would be the concentration of the acetate? It would also be 0.3 molar. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. For curiosity's sake, jeopardy's sake, it would be 0.3 molar for the sodium as well. Not that you need it in this problem, but it would be as well. Remember the way concentration works, right? Is if it breaks apart into like a one-to-one -one relationship, it will be the same concentration. If it's like a one-to-two relationship, you need to multiply the concentration by two, one to three, multiply by three, and so forth. So the important part here, when we do an ice table here in this sort of common ion situation is we actually need a number over here on the right-hand side. If I do not put a number on the right-hand side and I just put zero, what problem am I doing again? The one that we just previously did, right? I'm just doing the weak acid problem. So I'm not doing this common ion problem, which is really a buffer problem. So the rest of the table is gonna be very similar. This is gonna be minus X. Uh, this will be plus X. This will be plus X. That means when we get to equilibrium here, we got 0 0.2 minus X, X, 0 0.3 plus X. So just like we did before, we're going to go into our Ka expression. And mind you, since the acetic acid is still the same acid, this guy here, uh, that uh, Ka value is the one that you should use. So this will be our H plus, our acetate, and our acetic acid in this case. Putting in our numbers here is going to get us, uh, looks like here, X times 0 0.3 plus X up on top divided by 0 0.2 minus X going to equal 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. Having pretty good luck with the assumptions today. So why not continue on the streak here? 
So here we're going to assume that X is equal to zero. Once again, in this case, it is going to be our X's that we are either subtracting or adding. So this X and this X here are the ones that we're going to do. So that will reduce us back down to uh, basically X times 0 0.3 up on top divided by 0 0.2 on the bottom equals 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. We are in this case going to multiply the 0.2 to the other side and then come back and divide by the 0.3 and that would get us something. It's gonna get us a X value here of I'll do a little 1.2, a little scientific notation, I suppose, times 10, one, two, three, four, five, minus five. At this point here, uh, we want to again check it just to make sure. So as I mentioned before, if you check one number, usually they're both okay. So why don't we take the 0 0.3 number and see? We'll times it by 100. So we'll take that divided by the 0 0.3 times it by 100. You're nowhere even near uh, 1%, it's like 0 0.004. And again, you could do it for the other one as well. You could take the 1.2 times 10 to minus five divided by 0 0.2 times it by 100, and you're also, again, not even near 0.1%. So either one that you do there, the check is good. So once again here, coming back to our ice table, we do see that the H plus is equal to X. So concentration of H plus equals X, which equals 1.2 times 10 to the minus five. That then could go into our pH. And... gets us a pH of 4.92 in this case. First off, any questions on any part of that calculation there? <clears throat> when we compare the pH of our weak acid to the pH of our weak acid with a common ion, we see exactly what we were talking about the weak acid by itself had a pH of 2.72. With the presence of the common ion, it's going to force this equilibrium to the left, keeping this guy together, making this concentration go down. And the result of that is we actually see the pH went up from where it started with, with just the weak acid by itself at 4.92 that sort of change in pH is a result of the common ion suppressing the acid from releasing the H plus concentration or the H plus ions. Any questions on any part of that calculation? Yes. I could if I remember what I said, so I'm gonna to try to say something similar to what I just said, but uh, basically what we see here with the actual numbers is we do see that the pH went up with the presence of the common ion. And really the reason for that is, as we talked about earlier, what we're actually seeing is because of that common ion is causing the equilibrium to shift to the left. And because it's causing it to shift to the left, that means the H plus concentration is actually going down. And the result of that is, as we see here, our pH should kind of head upwards from where it was uh, in comparison to the weak acid. And that's really because it's forcing that weak acid to stay together basically and not release as much free H plus. Because again, it is the amount of free H plus is in the solution that affects the pH, not like H attached to something has got to be free floating around in the solution uh, to sort of affect the pH. Other questions on that there? <clears throat> Okay, so this is sort of a common ion problem. And as we'll talk about here in just a second, this is really a buffer type problem. Now, in problems where we do have common ion effect, if we start out with a pretty reasonable initial concentration of our acid and so forth, what we will actually see is the equilibrium concentrations and the initial concentrations of everybody is pretty much the same. It doesn't really change all that much. And we could see that by just looking here at the one we just did. 
our initial concentration of our acetic acid was 0.2. When I take 0.2 and I, where is my X value right there? If I take 0.2 and I subtract 1.2 times 10 to the minus five, I essentially still have 0.2 left. It didn't really change all that much. When I look at my initial concentration of my acetate, it was 0.3. If I take 0.3 and add 1.2 times 10 to the minus five, it will essentially still be 0.3. So because of the suppression of the weak acid from breaking apart, your initial concentrations actually end up being pretty much the same for your equilibrium concentrations, which means in a situation like that, you frankly don't need to do an ice table. You can actually use what is referred to as the henderson hasselbach equation, as you could clearly see it in that box. Let me write it in that box. So that henderson hasselbach is the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the base concentration over the acid. That is the henderson hasselbach equation where the pKa value is equal to minus the log of the Ka. So the pKa value is minus the log of the Ka value, yes. It, it is, so uh, it technically is your conjugate base over your acid and stuff like that. So um, when you do these type of problems and we use this equation really for buffer problems, which are common ion problems, you can just keep it very simple and try to identify what the base is and what the acid is. And you gotta make sure the base goes on top, acid goes on the bottom. Um, but yeah, it technically is the conjugate base and, and what it says on there. So this is the henderson hasselbach equation, David Hasselhoff equation, whatever you like to call it. Um, but uh, this is the one that we typically could use for common ions, uh, which are again, really buffer uh, sort of programs. There are another sort of, couple of equations and relationships that are good to know, but I would recommend that you always use the henderson hasselbach equation in these situations. Sometimes people will use sort of the POH version of it, which the POH is equal to the PKB plus the log of the concentration of the acid over the base. So this is a little bit different and it doesn't give you the pH, but it gives you the pOH. And by the way, the pKB value is equal to minus the log of the KB value. So that's an alternative sort of version of this equation that sometimes people will use in a basic situation. And personally, I don't think the need for that is there because in most cases you're asked to solve for the pH, not the pOH. So you could do this equation and then you still got to subtract 14 at the end to get yourself to the pH. So you might as well just throw it into the henderson hasselbach equation there and get the pH directly. You can use the henderson hasselbach equation for an acidic, basic, neutral, it doesn't matter pH solution. Uh, you can use it for all situations, but some people will sometimes use that. But a nice relationship though, between sort of the pKa value and the pKb value is, if you take the pKa value plus the pKb value, it will actually equal 14. So that's a nice little relationship. So maybe you are given like a pKb value, but you want the pKa value, you could just subtract 14 and get it really quickly. Uh, you also then could get the Ka value from that, by the way. If I had the pKa value and I wanted to get the Ka value, what calculation would I do there? Yeah, it's kind of the same calculation as when we do pH to H plus, yeah? So it would be the inverse log of the minus pKa, which is the 10 and the caret and stuff like that. So you could kind of go from pKa or pKb value back to Ka or Kb. Uh, it is actually like, it's just the, uh, it's the P scale basically, like kind of like a math scale, um, kind of like pH and that type of thing. No, so the pKa value is uh, sort of a log base 10 of, of the big number, the Ka value. So it makes it kind of a more manageable number, if you will. Um, 
Yes, so that is how you would calculate uh, the pKa value. Yeah. So it's sort of like a easier sort of number to use, sort of, sort of that scale. Um, <clears throat> so the pKa value is related to the Ka value, which obviously a pKa value would go with a weak acid, right? A pKb value is related to the Kb value, which would go with a weak base. So those values go together. And sometimes when you do look up in uh, tables and stuff, and maybe some of you maybe saw it today, uh, sometimes for weak acids or weak bases, they give you like the pKa value or the pKb value rather than a Ka value or a Kb value. So this is the way you can kind of convert it and find the relationship between those two as well. So you could use any of these equations on here. Personally, like I said before, I would roll probably with this one here I'm making stars around, which is the henderson hasselbach equation. Because again, probably nine times out of 10, you're going to be asked for the pH of the solution. So no sense in just calculating the pOH just to subtract 14. But if you want to do that, you can. If you do do the pOH equation though, you got to remember it is the pKb and the acid and base are switched around from the original version of it. So if we go back to our problem we just did, which was uh, 0 0.2 molar acetic acid with basically 0.3 molar sodium acetate. And basically, if we look at these two guys and recognize that they are related to each other, right? And they're related to each other through acetic acid and not this sodium, which is just a spectator ion, but they are related to each other through the acetate which is a difference of one H plus, right? So that's like a weak acid and its conjugate base relationship, right? We talked about what Braun said, Lowry. Once you recognize those things, pretty much you could just roll right into your Henderson-Hasselbach equation. You would use your Ka value that they gave you, which was 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. So we could calculate the pKa minus the log of 1.8 times 10 to the minus five, should give you a 4.74, I believe. And we could then go into our equation, pH would equal 4.74 plus the log. And in this case, the acid, which would be the acetic acid, right? And the base would be our sodium acetate in this case. That is also sometimes a troublesome thing for people. The base, the conjugate base in this case has one less hydrogen, yeah? Also the conjugate base will have some type of spectator ion like a sodium, a potassium, a lithium, something going on there. Uh, so that's a good way to recognize which one's which. In addition, that's called an acid. So that would be a good thing to know, I suppose. Uh, so we'll go 0.3 up on top, 0.2 on the bottom. And if we do all this good stuff here, 0.3 divided by 0.2, take a little log action of it, and then add it to 4.74, uh, we're gonna get a pH of 4.92. No ice table needed, yes. So we can do it ice table wise. We could do it with this equation. Uh, there's no wrong way to do it, so that's good. Uh, so if you're not sure, you could do an ice table, but if you don't want to do the ice table, you could go into the Henderson-Hasselbach equation here and actually solve the problem pretty quickly. In a lot of cases, a lot of calculations, this is probably a good way to do it because it'll save you some time. No, it, it could work. Uh, it could work pretty much in, uh, in any situation. You will typically in these situations, I guess a better way to say it, you will typically in this situation probably have a relatively small uh, K value since it is a weak acid, right? So uh, it probably would be not really, a weak acid in general is not really breaking apart a lot to begin with. So it's mainly staying to the left-hand side, which means by default, the K values for those guys should be relatively on the small side. So you won't run into any situations where you have a, like a super large K value a K value that you would be using in this situation. Otherwise, it really wouldn't be a weak acid, right? Because it would all be going the other way. No? Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> yeah. So, 
Uh, you, you typically would need, you typically would need uh, both concentrations given to you to calculate the pH. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you would need to know what the pH of the solution is, and then you would be solving for probably one of the concentrations. Uh, but you definitely would need both concentrations to do it. Yeah. This equation is really for common ions, which is what buffers are. So this is really your buffer equation. So a good point to mention this is this. Um, you should not use this everywhere. Yeah. So this is equation is only for a very specific situation, which is this situation we're talking about here, which is a common ion, which is really a buffer situation. This is your equation for buffers. If it is not that situation, if the two things that you have concentrations for are not related to each other, you should not be using this equation. Because people do that, they go, cool, I got two numbers. I'm just gonna stick it into this equation, hope for the best, and you'll get a big X, yes? So it has to be this situation, they has to be related to each other. It really has to be a buffer, which is a common ion situation for you to use this equation. So. Don't use it everywhere. We wouldn't be using this in any of the previous calculations for that reason. Now, you can absolutely, if you are more comfortable doing ice tables and you want to do the ice tables, like we did previously on a couple of slides back here, um, you can do the ice table. The one thing you do want to watch out for if you do the ice table in this situation is what I mentioned before. It is a super common error people zero out this side, yeah? So you gotta have something there in order for it to really be a buffer or a common ion. And again, like we talked about a second ago, if you don't have anything there, you're just doing the weak acid problem. You're not doing this type of situation. So if you wanna do ice tables, it's fine. I would probably recommend the henderson ossebach because there's less room for error perhaps. Um, but if you do the ice table, it's fine. Just make sure you got something on that concentration on that initial. Otherwise, again, you'll be in a little bit of trouble there. Any questions on that there? All right, so why don't you try one now? What is the pH of the solution that contains 0.3 molar formic acid, I'll go with, and a little 0.52 molar potassium four? Okay, let's take a look at this one. Um, so we're looking for the pH of a solution that contains uh, formic acid, which is a little potassium formate. If you're not sure, we are given a Ka value. Uh, this guy's got the extra hydrogen, which means that's the acid. This guy's got like the spectator eye on there, uh, which means that's the base. So we definitely see a weak acid here related to a base. And they are related to each other. And again, the relationship here is the formic acid. If it did go into solution, would be the one that would set up the equilibrium. while our potassium formate there would basically break apart into a potassium ion and a formate ion here. With obviously the formate here being our common ion in question. So once you recognize that they are related to each other and again, you can see the difference between here and here it's just one H plus. So again, that Bronson Lowry definition of conjugate acid base pairs. So if you chose to do the ice table, which you could have, again, this is what it would look like. You would have an initial of 0.3. This would be zero. And again, the important part here is we would have 0.52 being supplied by the potassium formate. Change would be minus X uh, plus X plus X equilibrium 0 0.3 minus x, x 0 0.52 plus x. So if you chose the ice table around, this is what it should look like. And again, that being the important part there, you don't need to do any of that and then put it into the Ka value. You could just go into the henderson hasselbach equation, uh, which would be our pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. Our pKa value here going to be minus the log of the Ka, which is 1.7 times 10 to minus four. I think that's a 3.77 if I'm not mistaken on that. And <clears throat> I 
That means that the pH here would equal 3.77 plus the log once again of the base, which is the guy with the spectator eye on here, 0.52 up on top, and our acid, which is 0 0.3. So 0.52 divided by 0.3, take a log of it, and then add 3.77 to it. Looks like a 401 situation here. And our solution here would be acidic. Now, if you did the ice table from above, you went into your Ka, solve for X, which would equal the H plus concentration, then got the pH, you should end up basically the same spot. So again, it's just your personal preference, whichever way you want to do it. The uh, henderson Osbach again would probably be a quicker way to do it and maybe a little less room for error along the way. Any question on that particular one here? <clears throat> All right, so uh, what we've been talking about is common ions and really common ions are really buffer solutions. And a buffer solution is made up of either a weak acid and its conjugate base, are sometimes referred to the salt of its conjugate base. Or you can make a buffer out of a weak base and the salt of its conjugate acid. Now they both actually need to be in the solution to begin with in order for a buffer to actually work correctly, or I guess in order for you to have a buffer, they both need to be in there. Now, the definition of a buffer is a solution that will actually resist changes in pH when you add acid or base to it. So you have a solution that's a buffer, then you add additional acid or additional base to it, and it's able to resist really big changes in pH. A buffer is not necessarily a neutral solution. You can make a buffer at any pH you like. You can make an acidic buffer, you can make a basic buffer, you can make a neutral buffer as well. We'll see it on Tuesday when we calibrate our pH meter. There's like a buffer of four pH, a buffer of seven, and a buffer of 10. And they're all buffered solutions. So you can really make a buffer at any solution pH you want. Uh, sometimes people think it means it's a neutral solution when you make it. What it means is whatever pH that buffer is starting at, if you add acid or base to it, it will not jump giant in its pH. So if you had, for example, a buffered solution at a pH of five and you added some acid to it, it would not go from like a pH of five to a pH of one but it will move as you add acid, but maybe it goes from five to like 4.9, 4.95, you know, it comes down a little bit. And same thing if you added base to that buffer at five, it wouldn't go from like a pH of five to a pH of 12, you know, again, it will go up a little bit. So as you add acid and base to a buffer, you will see very small changes in the pH because it's able to handle that, but there will be changes in pH. And in fact, when you make a buffer in a lab situation, you actually adjust your pH to dial it in by adding your acid or base to just slowly get it to exactly the pH that you want. Because as you know, from making solutions, it's very hard to weigh out the exact right amount, right, that you need. And some gets lost, some doesn't get into the flask, right? So a lot of times when you calculate, like I'm going to make this buffer and it's going to be a pH of five, when you make it, it's like a pH of 4.8 maybe or something like that. So you have to kind of bring it up by adding some base to kind of dial it into exactly the pH that you want. So um, we are talking about really big changes in pH. Uh, it's able to resist. So how is a buffer really able to sort of do that? Let's talk about sort of how it's able to do that here. So let's first do it by talking about a thing that is not a buffer. So in a non-buffer solution, like our good friend, water is not a buffer. 
So when we take something like hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, and I add it to water, right? It is going to 100% break apart into H plus ions, right? And chloride ions. So if we look at our picture here, we take some HCl going in. We basically just produced a bunch of H pluses, right? And a bunch of Cl minuses. At this point, because we 100% have these ions there at equilibrium, we have basically just did what to the H plus concentration? It went up a lot, yeah, in a very quick time. Basically, all that has to do is go for a swim and you're going to generate H pluses, which means the H plus concentration goes up, the pH goes down. So in this situation, if you added hydrochloric acid to water, by adding that to water, what you're going to do is really jump up the amount of H plus really quickly. That's gonna cause the pH to shift down a lot and you will see a pretty good jump in the pH. It might go from five down to one in this case, depending on how much you added in there. So this obviously would not be able to resist the change of pH because of that. If we took some sodium hydroxide and added sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base to water, it also would 100% break apart into sodium ions and hydroxide ions which means when we have a solution that it contains that, we got a bunch of sodium ions floating around. And we got a bunch of hydroxide ions basically floating around in the solution. The presence of all this hydroxide concentration or ions that are floating around is important because as the hydroxide concentration goes up, what happens to the H plus concentration? It goes down. Yeah, they are tied together. As one goes up, the other goes down. So by putting the strong base into the solution of water, we just generate a lot of OH minus really quickly. That increases the amount of OH minus, decreases the amount of H plus. And what we'll see is because we have more OH minus, we will see the pH jump up. So in this situation, by generating that much OH minus really quickly, we will see a pretty good jump in pH. Again, you might actually see it go from five to 12 when you add something like sodium hydroxide in there because of the production of all that free OH minus. And in the case of the HCl, the production of the H plus going to affect the pH. So in a non-buffer solution, we would expect to see pretty good jumps in pH when we add acid or base to it, because pretty much the H plus and OH minus is just like going in for a ride and no, no control over it. Now, what happens if we add those guys to our buffer? So we'll use everybody's favorite buffer system, which is acetic acid and a little sodium acetate. I know this is a buffer because this is a weak acid and this would be its conjugate base. By the way, this is referred to as the salt of its conjugate base because it has sodium. Yeah, so that's what makes it a salt basically. It has a spectator ion balanced out at the charge. The thing that actually is related to each other is the acetic acid. And really the working part of the buffer is the acetate. Once again, the difference between those two things is just one H plus. Again, the sodium's in there. It's a spectator ion. It's just balancing out the charge. It's not really doing much. So when we have a buffer such as this, what happens is the acetic acid is going to set up the equilibrium and it's going to basically be able to keep in the solution your acetic acid and your acetate. And you will have a certain amount of H plus in there as well to start with. By adding some sodium acetate in there with the acetic acid, what we have just done is essentially 
kind of beefed up the amount of these guys that we have in there. So we have pretty good amounts of both of those guys in the solution to begin with. What we really have in the solution, right, is a acid part to the buffer and a base part of the buffer. So those are the two things that we have in the solution. So when we go and add really the same acid as we did previously to this buffer situation, we take our HCl and we go and gonna dump it into here. The hydrochloric acid will react with part of the buffer. Which part of the buffer will the hydrochloric acid react with? The acetic acid or the acetate? It is the acetate, yeah? That's because acid base reactions, right? They're not called acid-acid reactions, right? So it wouldn't react with the acetic acid. So it's going to react with the base part of the buffer. And when it does so, I'll leave the sodium in there. You basically get a double displacement reaction happening here. You got this guy and this guy switching partners. The result of that is you will make acetic acid. And you will make a little sodium chloride action happening here. That's not too bad. So this is the result of adding HCl to our buffer system. We will get this reaction that occurs. So let's take a look on the product side and see what we did here. On the product side, we made some acetic acid, right? That was actually part of the buffer to begin with. We actually made more of the acetic acid. It was already part of the buffer. So that is not going to screw up the pH because it was there originally. And that is always what happens in this situation. You actually make more of one part of the buffer. The other thing that we made here, if we look at it, is we made sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is a salt, yes. That is a salt. What type of salt is that? Acidic basic neutral. That is a neutral salt, right? It contains sodium, which is group one, and it contains Cl minus, which came from HCl, which is a strong acid. That is a neutral salt. So that probably is not going to affect the pH either. So we made part of the buffer and we made something that's neutral, so it won't affect the pH. Why the pH doesn't actually change all that much in this case is actually for what we do not see here. And what is we don't see here that we saw occur when we added the HCl to water? What was on the product side when we added the HCl to water? H plus, yes. H plus is kind of important for the pH because if you make more H plus, your pH is going to go crazy. In this case, there is no free H plus made, which means as a result of this reaction, we didn't make any more H plus, which means that the concentration of H plus will remain relatively constant. And if the H plus concentration stays relatively constant, that means the pH will also stay relatively constant. So when we react to acid with a buffer, it will actually react with the base part of the buffer. The end result of that is it doesn't allow free H plus to be formed in that solution. And that means whatever H plus you got going on there to begin with is pretty much the H plus that you got there now and that will keep the pH relatively constant. I say relatively constant because the reality is it will go down a little bit, yeah? But you will not see a very big jump in pH because you didn't just influx a bunch of H plus really, really quickly. And pretty much all was sort of handled by the base part of the buffer. 
Any questions on that there? So let's take a look at what will happen if we take the same buffer and we basically add the sodium hydroxide to it. So we'll take our same acetic acid and sodium acetate buffer, which once again, when it kind of is in the beaker, if you will, we'll be able to set up our acetic acid our acetate and our H plus, right? So once again, we have the acid part of the buffer in the solution. We have the base part of the buffer in the solution. And now what we're going to do is add some <clears throat> sodium hydroxide here, you go for a swim. So when I add sodium hydroxide to this buffer, it's gonna react with which part of the buffer? It's going to react with the acid part of the buffer, which is the acetic acid. And we will get sodium hydroxide plus some acetic acid. We will get a acid base reaction that will occur. And here we will get really a double displacement reaction happening as well. We will get some sodium acetate. And I'll go underneath. We will also get some water here as well. So once again, in this reaction here, we're going to generate some sodium acetate, which once again was part of the buffer to begin with. So that is not going to affect the pH of the solution. We also generated water, which will not affect obviously the pH. It is again here, what we don't see that we did see when we added the sodium hydroxide to water. What we don't see here is there is no OH minus like there is when we added it to water. When we add it to water, we produce a lot of OH minus really quick, but here there is no free OH minus formed. Now, the reason that's important is if the OH minus concentration stays relatively constant, that means that the H plus concentration, which is tied to the OH minus concentration, will also stay relatively constant. And thus, it will also mean that your pH will stay relatively constant as well. So in this case, what happens when we add a base to a buffer, the acid part of the buffer will pretty much tie up the OH minus into water, not allowing the OH minus to be freely floating in the solution. That keeps ultimately our OH minus concentration not increasing and that keeps our H plus concentration staying about the same and that keeps our pH from staying about the same as well. Again, you will see a slight rise in the pH if you add some uh, base to it, but you won't see a giant jump in it. So ultimately the way a buffer works is because it has an acid part and it has a base part and they both need to be in the solution together to be a buffer. When you add additional acid to it, it's able to prevent the formation of free H plus, or when you add additional base to it, it's able to prevent the formation of free OH minus. Both of those situations basically keep overall the H plus concentration relatively constant and also then the pH stays relatively constant as well. Any questions on how a buffer works there? Yeah. Now, ultimately, when you make a buffer, you know, you oftentimes will start with perhaps kind of equal parts of the like acid part of the buffer and the base part of the buffer. And then when you add some acid to it, it needs to use up some of the base, right, to react with, but it will make some of the acid part. So what you end up getting is this situation here, badly drawn, but we'll try it. 
where this is the acid part of the buffer. That's the base part or buffer. And same thing, if you took your buffer and you added base to it, what would happen is it will react with some of the acid part and make some of the base part. So you always make part of the buffer in this reactions and you use up a little bit of the other part there. Uh, that would be our acid part. And our base part. There is something known as buffer capacity. There is a limit to how effective a buffer will be. What would happen if I didn't follow the instructions? I'm sure that would never happen. But if you didn't follow the instructions and you were talking and you just kept adding acid to your buffer, what would eventually happen? If you keep adding acid, right? You're using up more base, right? Using up more base, using up more base, using up more base. To at some point, you got no more base part of your buffer there. What would then happen if you continue to add past that point? You would then just be adding to that solution more H plus. Yeah. And once you blow through sort of the base part of your buffer, you would add more H plus, you would see a pretty big jump in pH going down. Same thing if you added too much base, you would keep using up the base part or acid part until at some point you're now just dumping in their hydroxide and you would see the pH go up. So there is a limit to how good your buffer could be. It has to do with the concentration, both of your buffer and what the concentration of what you're adding. So if you had a buffer that was maybe 0.01 molar in strength, and you misread the instructions where it said to take the 0.1 molar HCl and you grab the 18 molar HCl and you dumped it in there, you would blow right through your buffer. There's only a certain amount of moles of your acid part of your buffer and your base part of your buffer available in that solution to react. And if you add too much of the incoming acid or base, you actually can blow through it. How can I make a pH at a specific, a buffer at a specific pH? I could actually use the Henderson Hasselbach equation to help me kind of decide what would be a good buffer to make or what would be a good thing to make my buffer out of. If I make my buffer with equal parts of the base part and the acid part, that means that this thing would become the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of one over one, yes. The log of one is equal to zero, yeah. Which means if you use about equal amounts of your base and acid part of your buffer, typically speaking, you wanna pick a weak acid or weak base that has a pKa value plus or minus one of like your pKa desired pH. So you're looking for a weak acid as a pKa value plus or minus one of the pH you're looking to make. So if I was looking to make a buffer with a pH of 4.5, acetic acid would be not a bad choice necessarily because it has a pKa value of 4.74. So that's pretty close. A probably crappier choice would be like ammonium because that has a pKa value of like 9.25. That's gonna take a lot of solution to get yourself down to where you need to be. So there's different acids and bases, obviously you have different pKa values and so forth. When you're trying to choose what I wanna make my buffer out of, typically you're looking for one that has a pKa value, you know, plus or minus one of your desired pH for your buffer. Any questions on that there? Question on buffers, how they work. Anyway. Okay. So obviously here, a buffered solution will be able to really resist the big changes in pH uh, as opposed to what we see water. Just adding a little bit of HCl causes a pretty big drop in the pH um, of that uh, non buffer solution. All right, so which of the following would be a uh, buffer system? Let's start with the first one, HF and KF. Would that make a buffer? 
How do I know if it will make a buffer? I should look for two things that are related to each other, right? So that is an acid. That is a weak acid, by the way, right? Because it has a Ka value. This is a salt, which is basically K plus and F minus, which means these two guys are related to each other by a difference of H plus. The K there makes it a salt of its conjugate base but it's not really doing anything, but it is the F minus. So because that's a weak acid and really F minus is this conjugate base, this would be a buffer. So I'm gonna go with yes, that would be a buffer. Any questions on that one there? B, we have HBr, which is an acid, and we have KBr, which once again is really K plus and Br minus. So this guy and this guy are related to each other by one H plus. What type of acid is that? It is a strong. Is this going to be a buffer? It is not going to be a buffer. So this will not be a buffer. The reason it will not be a buffer is this is a strong acid. Why do buffers need to be a weak acid or a weak base? Why can a buffer not be really a strong acid or a strong base? What happens with a strong acid or strong base? Does it stay together or does it break apart? It breaks apart, which means when you have a strong acid like HBr, when it's in solution, you basically have only those two things, which means you basically have just the base part. You no longer have the acid part. There's none of those guys in the solution. So a buffer can never ever be made up of a strong acid or a strong base for the same reason, because they're not able to set up the equilibrium. Only a weak acid or a weak base is able to set up the equilibrium. And that's important based on our conversation here. That is important because when they're able to set up the equilibrium, they can keep the acid part and the base part in the solution, they're together. And without that in a strong acid or strong base, you just get either the base part or you get the acid part. You can't keep both of them in the solution together. So a buffer always has to be weak acid or weak base, can never be made up of a strong acid or strong base. And I make a slight distinction that you can actually make a buffer from a strong acid but the strong acid is no longer there when it's all said and done. The result of that reaction makes the buffer, not the actual strong acid or strong base. And this guy here would also be a buffer. We really have here CO3 two minus, and we get rid of the sodium. We got a little bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate. Those two guys are related to each other by one H plus. And most of you probably maybe saw this guy today as part of carbonic acid, which has a Ka1, Ka2, which would imply that that's going to be a weak acid. So once again, that would be sort of a weak acid conjugate base situation, and it would be a buffer in this case. Any questions on any of those things there? All right, let's take a look here. All right, let's start with uh, part A here first. So calculate the pH of a buffer system that contains one molar acetic acid and one molar sodium acetate. Let's we'll start with B and see what you come up with. Ka values on the bottom there, 1.8. Okay, let's take a look at part A here. Uh, so. Honestly, they say it's a buffer, <laughs> which is good. If they did tell you it's a buffer, you need to be able to look at these two things and recognize that they are related to each other. Yeah, acetic acid, sodium acetate. Again, it is the acetate part here that's really the thing that is related. This is a salt of its conjugate base, basically the sodium, not really doing anything but balance out the charges. Once you can see that it's a buffer, why hesitate go into the henderson hasselbalch equation? Yeah, and that would be our pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. Once again, here, our pKa value will be minus the log of the Ka, which would be 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. 
I can give you a 4.74 pKa value. At this point, we could go pH is equal to 4.74 plus the log. Once again, here it is going to be our sodium acetate, which is our base. And that'll be one divided by one in this case, which means as we saw before, that will give us a pH of 4.74 in this case. Yeah. You also, again, could have done an ice table if you chose to do the ice table. The equilibrium would be the weak acid equilibrium you would set up. Initially, this would be one, this would be zero. And once again, the important part here, that would be one as well. Change minus X plus X plus X equilibrium one minus X, X one plus X. Once again, you would solve for X, which would equal the H plus concentration and then to the pH, which should get you to get back to here as well. So again, if you want to do the ice table, you can still do it at this point. Any questions on that there? So let's talk a little bit about part B here. Part B, we want to know what is the pH of the solution after we add 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid to it. In this particular problem, and not in all problems, but in this particular problem, we're going to assume uh, that the volume doesn't change. So everything just one liter for everybody, just to keep the numbers really simple. That's not always the case. You may actually have volumes for everybody. Uh, but in this case, we're just going to kind of keep it simple and assume uh, one liter for everything. So this brings us to a really important sort of concept for buffers and later titrations as well. And it's the idea of if I have a solution that has a particular molarity and I take another solution that has a particular molarity and I mix them together. Right? So let's just say this guy was two molar, this guy was say four molar to begin with. When I put them together, does that guy stay four molar? Does that guy stay two molar? Does the molarity stay the same? or does the molarity change as you mix solutions together? Molarity is the true definition, moles of solute, right? Divided by liters of solution, which means when we add one solution to another solution, that means this number is changing, right? Which means if that number is changing, so is the molarity changing, right? The one thing that doesn't change when you add volume to volume is which thing there? It is actually the moles of the solute, the stuff that's dissolved in those sort of solutions. It is the moles of the solute stays the same. By the way, it is the solute in all these solutions that's actually reacting. Yeah, that's actually what's in there. It's the moles of those guys that's in that solution that's actually reacting when you throw things together. So a really important concept is like what we're going to be doing here in part B, whenever you add a volume of something to another volume and you need to do an ice table, which is what we will need to do here. You need to do the ice table in moles, not molarity. So whenever you're adding volume, you need to do need to do the ice table in moles. So usually in this situation, what will happen is you will need to do the ice table in moles. But once you're done with the ice table, it is really good practice to convert the moles back to molarity. So you wanna do the ice table in moles. Once you get to the equilibrium part and you figure out what everybody's equilibrium moles are, then you wanna convert it back to molarity at that point. So you wanna do that ice table in moles, then convert back to molarity by using the total volume at that point. 
So for example, here, if this was five milliliters and I dumped it into this thing that was 10 milliliters, I would convert back to molarity by knowing my total volume there would have been 15 milliliters in this example. So it's really important. Typically what this means is there's usually like a first ice table that you have to do in this situation that you want to do it in moles. And then you should just automatically always convert it back to molarity. Because at some point in some calculations, you may be done at that point, or you may need to take those numbers and continue on with another calculation where you do need molarity. So it's just a safe practice afterwards to convert it back but you do need to convert it to moles first and then back to molarity after that ice table. Any questions on that there? So I think based on the time is probably a good place to start and we will do an example of that on Tuesday. A um, couple of things here.